the bell has rung. So get seated and join Elementary Schooled for today's interview. Welcome to Elementary School. This is season two, episode 10. And today I'm absolutely delighted to have Dr. Charles Fay. He is the CEO of Love and Logic, and he is going to be joining us talking about how to raise mentally strong kids and has a new book coming out, which I'm really excited about because the timing of this is so great. Welcome, Dr. Charles Fay. Well, oh, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you and everybody joining us. So great to be with you today. Thank you. I do. We do have a lot of listeners now, a lot of parents, a lot of educators, and we're always trying to figure out how to help our kids as things are evolving and changing in this world. I just will briefly introduce you. You do have a lot of accolades, but you're very humble. I'll keep, so I'll keep it kind of concise, but Dr. Charles Fay, you earned your PhD uh, with the highest honors in 1997. Prior to and during your university training in school and clinical psychology, you enjoyed extensive experience working with children in psychiatric public school and mental health settings. You currently work full-time as an author, consultant, public speaker, and the CEO of Love and Logic Institute. And your most prized accolade is that you are also a parent. So that's really important. Are you a grandparent too? Not yet. Not yet. I have, no, I have three boys. Uh, one of them's 40. Uh, one of them is 30. Okay. And then we had a surprise blessing 17 years ago. So we have a 17 year old um, <laughs> uh, still at home, uh, enjoying him uh, That's a great. lot. Yeah. Is he a senior? And, uh, yeah, he he actually started college early, so he's oh, going wow. to college. Yeah, and so that's a real mind bender. Uh, but yeah, he uh, he started early, and so he's he's taking complex classes that I can't understand already. So, uh, but anyway, it's hard, right, folks listening? Yeah. I mean, it's challenging, right? It's challenging. Yes. Yeah, so I love that. I know you co-wrote this book. Is that right? That's right. I wrote it with. Uh, a uh, world-renowned um, psychiatrist, adult and child psychiatrist, who's known for uh, his work on brain scans and understanding how we can help our brains be healthier. Dr. Daniel Amen, wonderful man, also a parent. He's a grandparent. We had a wonderful time writing the book. We called it uh, Raising Mentally Strong Kids. And it comes out at the end of March. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. It's coming out very, very soon. Oh, thank you. Let's dive into it. But, but first, I want to ask kind of a fun loving question as your dad is the famous uh, Dr. Jim Fay, um, who is the co founder of Love and Logic and is a world renowned expert. I just want to know. Well, I think people might be dying to know what's it like to be raised by Jim Fay, and also is your mom as equally love and logicy? <laughs> well, I I think I became a psychologist just to figure out what happened to me when I was a kid. Uh, <laughs> but you know the 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 thing that carried him along because they didn't have this figured out. I mean, this is a lifelong struggle for all of us, right? You're you're sure. not alone if you're still working on this, <laughs> listeners. Right. But uh, they were good people, and, and that that's really the foundational piece here. You know, it's who are we in front of kids? Yeah, because uh, we're going to make a lot of mistakes, all of us. But are we always learning? Are we always doing our best to love them? in in really healthy ways and and they did that and um and my mom i think she she really kind of raised my dad so he was mature enough to develop love and logic but that's a that's a longer story we won't go into I love it that. i think women yeah. will love that because yeah you teaming as a parent as parents like there's a lot of teaming but your styles are different just as individual people and and you know they remember two things and i want to i want to keep this simple for all of us because not because we're not smart enough to understand complex things, but that our intelligence just kind of oozes out of us as soon as we hit a stressful situation with a kid. Uh, do you have the same problem? 
Oh yeah. Right, you're right. You, you know, you're in the heat of it. And then all of a sudden, all those things you learn in the past kind of slip out. And so we want to keep it really simple. And, and they, they focused on two things, which are really the two rules of love and logic for adults. And the first rule is we take good care of ourselves in loving ways. That's right. And we do that by setting healthy limits. Now, why do we take good care of ourselves? Because kids need leaders. They need role models. And a very damaging trend has happened over the last uh, couple decades where the, the child has been put first all of the time and adults haven't been taking good care of themselves, just trying to make kids happy all the time. Yeah. Some of you have noticed that trend. And then kids have no role, role models. Who do I look up to? Yeah. When my parents are groveling, right, trying to make me happy all the time. So we want to do it in a loving way, but we take good care of ourselves. The second rule of love and logic is that when a kid creates a problem or they encounter a problem that they can handle, we hand that problem right back to them in a loving way. Yeah. You know, the, it, it's something that is, is integral to our book, uh, Raising Mentally Strong Kids, is that kids need to face trials in order to grow and be strong enough to handle life and also in order to feel confident. Yes. And, and so those two things were big in our family. Uh, take good care of yourself as an adult, set healthy, loving limits. And number two, when a kid has a problem, hand it back to them, be there to guide them, be them there to provide emotional support, but don't rescue when you don't have to. Yes. And don't be a helicopter parent, which we've all tried and it doesn't work out so well. But I, I love that you're uh, reinforcing those two concepts and especially saying take care of ourselves first, because I know at times in my life, if I've been experiencing some kind of personal hardship and how it affects you, your kids are really watching you to see how you handle it. That's right. They're like earthquake detectors, right? They, they, can, they can sense tremors. <laughs> They're okay. across the globe, the smallest things, and they play them out. And the same goes for educators. I know there's educators uh, joining us and these principles, they apply, don't they? They sure do in the classroom because you have a lot of tricky situations. Almost every day you have something new come up that you yeah. are just maybe not necessarily surprised, but you didn't plan on and you and, and then all the students are looking at, at you as the teacher or educator in the room of how how is this going to be handled and they're learning from that even if it, it doesn't directly involve that student tell us what has been fascinating about the research you've done in writing this book raising mentally strong kids well, what's been really fascinating is that, that fortunately we see an awful lot of people let's let's put a positive side on this too that are really doing a great job with their kids. Wonderful sure. teachers doing a wonderful job in classrooms. And uh, uh, one of the questions that I know you want to ask me is, uh, you know, three ways, three yes. things that people do that, that really prevent all the depression. That's one of the things we're seeing. Lots of depression in kids, lots of anxiety, lots of anger, lots of mental health challenges. And and more young adults who are desperately unprepared for life, they know it, and now they're panicking because now they're interfacing with it. They're right there in life now, and they're desperately anxious and depressed because, quite frankly, they know they haven't been allowed to struggle enough. Right. And so that's the research we're really looking at is all of this anxiety, all this depression, all this, these mental health challenges. Uh, one of the core common denominators is not enough loving limits and not enough opportunities for these kids to struggle and see that they are capable. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's, let's talk about a plan. It's Let's make a, a plan. Give us three ways, three ways very, to help our kids in the classroom and at right. home. Very, very simple. And this is this is an 
a major oversimplification, but okay. I've had a lot of people over the years say, Hey, I really like oversimplifications. Okay. I love <laughs> because, that. I just love that, yeah. that word oversimplification. Yes. Yeah. It's a wonderful word. And, and we can always learn more, but when we have that framework that we can plug the more into, then we can be really successful. And uh, so the, the first thing that we're seeing, uh, and, and Dr. Daniel Amy does such a great job of this, is that uh, absolutely essential that we are teaching kids to fall in love with their own brains. Because when you love something, you're going to take good care of it. And from, from his thousands and thousands of brain scans, uh, he's discovered that much of the anxiety, many of the learning problems, impulse issues have to do with brain health issues. Uh, parents uh, help kids protect their brains, absolutely make it uh, a non-negotiable that they wear those helmets uh, when they're, they're performing activities like riding their bikes or on their skateboards. We really want to take a very careful look. This is going to make some people mad, but football, it, you know, too many shocks to the brain. And it doesn't have to be an observable brain injury. You know, there is a plenty of space between the brain and the inside of the skull. And when that starts uh, banging around inside there, then we start seeing significant issues that manifest themselves in terms of, again, the classic executive function issues, teachers, we, mm -hmm. we throw that term around, but yep. it's lack of self-control. Okay. Yep. Uh, anger outbursts, hyperactivity, uh, lots of uh, depression, those sorts of things, difficulty with self-control. So there's a lot of ways that we teach kids to take good care of their brains, but we need to make that a primary focus. Uh, and throughout the book, we talk about the physical organ of the brain and how we can take good care of that through uh, obvious things like wearing helmets, but also uh, diet, exercise, uh, a lot of the different things we do. So that's got to be number one. Protect number two, and love your brain. Protect, protect and love, love your protect brain. Protect and love the brain. Yeah, absolutely. And okay. Uh, the others are related. It's all related. Yes. See, the brain and the mind are intertwined. The, the, the second one is we build really strong relationships with kids. The, the, the relationship we have with our kids, with our students, is more powerful than the sum total of all other strategies known to humankind. It's more curative than the sum total of all other strategies known to humankind. It's that relationship. And uh, one of our, our favorite relationship building strategies, we call it the one sentence intervention, where we write down six unique things about our kids or our students, the things that they love. And uh, it's things like they like to draw or they like horses or they like a certain sport or they have a dog. Those, those little things that are really big to people. The little things are the big things. And, and we go to the kid uh, when there's a moment of calm. Sometimes I say, find that microsecond within which you're not having a power struggle with the kid, right? And you go to the kid. And you whisper, I noticed. I noticed that you like to draw, something like that. You say that. and But you don't evaluate it. You don't say, that's great. You just say, I noticed. I noticed that uh, you have a dog. You have a dog bracelet. And, and then you just smile at the kid. And if they want to talk, you let them talk. If they look uncomfortable, you walk away. Let's see, how deep of a human emotional need is it to be noticed. I mean, what will people do to get noticed? And we developed the, that technique years and years ago for busy teachers, and they would say things, I can't believe it. You know, now I've got these really tough kids who are, uh, you know, I can go to them and I have a relationship with them where I can say, hey, would you stop doing such and such just for me? Thank you. And as I'm starting to step away, I hear, oh, well, okay, fine. Wow, is that a win compared to what I used to get? Sure. 
and then we started teaching it to, to parents and uh, they're, they're saying the same thing. That little thing, noticing and listening, noticing and listening, so powerful. What I love about this concept is noticing is just, is just validation, really validation, acceptance, but it's not overdoing it with where we're in a world now where we give so much praise and and so much we kind of what we've overcompensated would you say and then it creates some entitlement excessive praise creates pain let me say that again Cre excessive praise excessive praise creates pain creates pain tell us well i think all of us know somebody who has become pretty much addicted to it and then when they don't get it how do they feel they feel deprived they feel like the rest of the world is against them. How come I'm not getting all those accolades that I used to get? And see, anytime we get somebody addicted to something, then I think, quite frankly, we ought to feel some remorse over that. You know, yeah. it's okay to feel remorseful about doing things that aren't good for other people. And excessive praise is not good for kids. Uh, they also start to feel like I'm not going to try anything. Lots of research done on this. I'm not going to try anything unless I know for sure I can do it perfectly. Interesting. Yeah, because, I've never you know, heard it worded quite that way. And I think that's powerful that excessive well, praise creates pain. So what we're doing is we're, we're without knowing it, we're give, it's detrimental to their brain then and not protecting their brain because we're feeding, we're feeding right. that praise and then they think they need it yeah and but let's talk about kids who've been hurt who have a lot of pain and they don't feel good about themselves and sometimes we unwisely try to praise them because we our heart breaks for them we want to be positive so we we just lavish all this praise on them do they really believe it no it doesn't fit with their worldview. It doesn't fit with how they view themselves. And then the brain goes into the action of try to confirm your own belief about yourself. This teacher just told you something about yourself you don't believe in. And so what's all the evidence that you have that supports how you already feel about themselves? Then they have to dredge up all the negative things they believe about themselves to confirm their own worldview. See, that teacher unwittingly just stimulate that kid to, to drag up all of the negative things that they feel about themselves. Yeah, praise can be very painful for people who've been hurt. Um, tell me this. I was actually at a, a youth thing the other day with tons of youth. And I don't know, they were talking about love languages. And one of the, one of the kids, I don't know, teenagers said, I know that my love language is words of affirmation. It's praise. Yeah. And and um, she's an athlete. She's good at school. Um, and she, I don't know, everyone was kind of taking a moment to just share about themselves. What do you, what do you say to that? Where's, where do we cross the line from, you know, we want to give a compliment or meet someone's needs. Um, but I hear what you're saying, especially when we live in a fairly entitled world. And that's becoming a real problem where empathy is going down and entitlement is going up. Uh, what what would you say to that? Well, first of all, if you as an adult um, see something that excites you and there's a spontaneous reaction like, oh, that's great, you know, hey, don't feel bad about that. That's natural. That is uh, healthy. It's good for people. Uh, because you did it spontaneously and authentically, where the praise really becomes a problem is when we have a motivation inside of ourselves where either on a conscious or unconscious level, we think, okay, if I praise this kid enough, then I'm going to get a result that I like. I see. Yeah. Okay. See? Yeah. I and, see. And, and it's so easy for us to fall into that with kids and adults, right? Mm -hmm. I want to ask a follow-up to that. I know the word narcissism is overused today. You know, there's a lot online about it. But right. In your opinion, if in that excessive praise, is that possibly what's happening that we can create a sense of narcissism, which really just means selfishness? 
No, absolutely. Yeah. Excessive praise, permissiveness, uh, that, that all creates narcissism. In fact, there was a term that I still think applies, spoiled. It, it's spoiled, right? Because they start to believe that the world revolves around them, but that's a recipe for pain for them as well. Because at the heart of every narcissist is massive pain and anger. Why can't I be the star of the show all the time? Mm, yeah. Okay. Now, let's be fair, though. You know, there's a principle in psychology that goes like this. The, the, the result of the opposite is almost always the same. And so when we have overindulgence, we see narcissism. But when we have kids who haven't been taken care of, they haven't been loved, they haven't had a positive word, they've, they've had trauma, abuse, neglect, that can also create narcissism. Is that because the they feel they're owed something as they get That's older? That's right. They feel they're yeah, owed it, Yeah, exactly. So you know, now, now it's my turn. And I'm going to get everything that I wasn't given before when I was younger. Uh, the second piece, though, is if you really want to be careful about this, which I think we should, get in the habit of noticing and describing instead of praising. So what does this look like? I had an experience with one of my sons. He hit a home run and it wasn't a common thing for him. He hit a home run in baseball. And I thought, oh, I'm going to experiment with this and see how it goes. Because in the past, I'd be, oh man, look at that, went over the ball. <laughs> I'm so excited. Yeah, all the you know? excitement and, and it is exciting, sure. Again, let's not get judgy with ourselves and other people over right. this. Spontaneous is fine, right? We're not about being legalistic here, okay? Yeah. Um, but I thought, oh, I'm going to try something different. So I see him after the game and I could tell he's feeling pretty tall. You know, and I, I said, well, I saw when you got up there, it was the second pitch that he threw you and he hung that curveball, and you saw it just sitting up there, you know, and you swung on it and your stance was really square and it, and it just, it sailed right over the, the fence. And then I, I shut my mouth. It was so hard to do, okay? And then he's like, yeah, dad, he's telling me all about it. He's so happy because I let it be his. Mm. I let the emotions be his, his joy, right? Yeah. That's and cool. I've seen you, that with you, so- You shared observations of your noticing. You yeah. shared, you shared details instead of just great job. Well, it, it forces it forces us to get specific. This idea, um, there there's another piece of it that is healthy, and that it that it focuses on the the kids' emotions, as I said, and, and that, that's very important. Okay, so I want them you. to feel I want them to feel really good about their triumphs, and I want them to have the appropriate emotions around their struggles and what i mean by that is it's it's okay for them to have sadness or disappointment or discomfort associated with struggles we don't want to prolong that but think about it when they have a struggle and i say something like oh yeah you really struggled with that assignment maybe i get the report card oh you really struggling with that that's got to be hard um, what do you think you could do? Let me know if you want some ideas. But but I but I let them own it. Just provide a little empathy. They, they they're going to struggle with that. They're going to have some discomfort associated with that, which I hate as a parent, as a as a teacher. I hate it. I I don't want kids to feel that way. But let's think about this together. Do we have to have those feelings in order to really experience the true joy of those mountaintop experiences? Yeah, that's cool. It's um, it's really kind of taking a step back and and letting your child or your student really kind of get there on their own, which is satisfying. So we're more like facilitators. We're guiders. We're facilitating. 
That's absolutely right. Now, I I want to make sure though. I I said let's let's give them a plan. Let's talk about a plan. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I said there's three things. Well, I've only talked about two. I've only made two really clear here. Number one, teach them to love their brain and protect it. Number number that's number one. Number two, yeah. build healthy relationships and. And number three, it, it again, it's allow them to face those struggles. We've talked a lot about that in this interview so far, but again, have to say it, how do we help kids get prepared for a world full of struggles? We allow them to have the ones they're having right now. That's good practice. And be in it with them, but not overpower the overpower the plan is that what you'd say like co some collaboration it, i think about it in terms of where we stand metaphorically speaking you know, there's a we we are tempted to stand between the kid and life between the kid and the world and when we're doing that we're either rescuing or the helicopter parent or teachers can be helicopters too right sure yeah we're standing between the kid and we're kind of like hey kid don't worry about this i've got this handled you know i'll rescue you from all these challenges and that sends uh, this message unintentionally you're weak you can't handle life you can't solve problems so i'm going to do it for you mm. It's telling them that they might not be capable when we right. want to encourage that they are capable. And I trust you. I trust your judgment. I trust that you'll be able to make a plan or resolve this thing that I I feel really sad. I feel sad with you. I'm sorry you're going through that, but I trust that you're going to work it out. So true. And, and then, then there's the drill sergeant. Okay. That's another parenting or teaching style. And then, they're not that much different than the helicopter. Uh, I mean, the, the, their motivation is kind of the same. I want to make sure that everything turns out well. Yeah. I want to control the outcome. Okay. And so they too stand between the kid and life, between the kid and the real world. And the, the message, the underlying message again, is you're not strong enough to think, so I'll think for you. You know, I'll tell you what to do all the time. Now, here's the consultant parent or a consultant educator. Where are they standing? They're standing beside the kid. Yeah, the kid has the opportunity to look right at the world there, interface with the world. Now, the consultant is standing beside, which means that they're deeply involved in it, but involved in a wise way. See, love and logic is not like, oh, hey, kid, go for it. You know, I'll right. just wait over here. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. we're right there. Right there beside them. And we're evaluating the seriousness of the situation. And, and by the way, sometimes we make a judgment call and we think this is too big. We're going to need to jump in and rescue the kid. And that's great because don't we all need to be rescued from time to time? And there's a place for that. But does it make sense we uh, keep those two things to a minimum? So we don't we don't want to create a habit of rescuing our right. kids every once in a while, depending on the situation, of course. But if it's the habit, then they then they're always looking to us and and maybe questioning in their own mind in that brain we're trying to help and protect and love. They might be questioning, "Wow, maybe I really can't solve problems." So That's right. building that in them. I love this. So number one, fall in love with your own brain. Take care of your brain. Yeah. And parents, we have to take care. And teachers, we have to take care of our brains. And two, building the relationships, not overpraising. Um, I love the noticing, noticing and not overpraising. And then allowing them to be in their struggles. That's, that's absolutely right. And by the way, when we have healthy relationships and when we uh, allow kids to face the struggles and work through them, we're actually helping them grow the brain. See, all these things are interconnected. See, the only way the brain can really grow is if it has some problems to solve, if it has some things to learn, if it has some challenges to overcome. 
That's the only way that the brain will really continue to mature, lay down more neural pathways that are more complex, a myelin sheath that uh, surrounds the nerve cells, that facilitates communication around the nerve cells, all dependent on healthy brain exercise, thinking, thinking. So we're helping them to build their character. And what I've found as a teacher and parent, I'm building I'm being reshaped myself as, as I do that. Like I'm building my own character as they're building theirs. So I, I find it very helpful to think of these two words. I actually have these written multiple places in my home and my office and firm and loving. <laughs> yeah. Firm and loving. That's actually, I learned that in the love and logic classes in 1994. I learned that because of my, because of parent teacher conferences, I thought not only to be firm and loving with the children, but be firm and loving with the parents, because sometimes the expectation is way up here um, for a teacher when you have, you know, 27 or 28 students in your class. And there are times, I love parents. I get along with parents. Parents are wonderful. I've learned a lot. But there are times when um, you feel like maybe the expectation is so high in terms of how many students are in a class. And so to be firm and loving in our communication with each other, which I, I, I really appreciate that. Those two are two really key ingredients to just probably all communication. Well, this book is not just about kids, working with kids, it's about working with our adult kids. There's a whole section in there. It's about, it's about marriage relationships. It's about relationships with friends. The same skills apply be, with the uh, teacher-parent relationship. And I, I think about it this way. We as adults so often still need to be parented. <laughs> we need somebody who can be firm, and loving. caring with us. <laughs> yeah, firm it's and true. loving. Yep. And sometimes it makes us that. sometimes it makes us mad, you know, yeah. in the short term. Well, most of us reflect back and think, yeah, that, that person really gave me a gift. They they loved me enough to be honest with me. And and they stood beside me and helped me develop some ideas for solving my problem. People need that. And give us kind of a, a quick overview of what the book is. Okay. Wow. There's a lot in the There's book. There's a we lot. Talk, so we've we got to get the book. Yeah. We give solutions. The book's about solutions. I love that you have specific scenarios um, yeah. because already in my endeavors here, I, people want very simplified uh, solutions and they want scenarios. So it sounds like your book is full of them. Dr. Daniel Amen and Dr. Charles Fay have written this book to help all of us with specific scenarios and strategies for helping to raise mentally strong kids. Thank you for all of this. I like to end with a little Christian thought, and it's just exactly what you have been saying now for the last many minutes, train up a child in the way he should go. I've always loved that little scripture from the Bible that um, in training though, it just, we're teaching, we're facilitating, we're guiding. And so thank you for sharing all of these great clips with us. Oh, thank you. And those who joined us, all of you, thank you so much for hanging out with us. Such an honor to speak with you. Thank you. It's very much appreciated. You know what you're doing and I applaud your work. Uh, Love and Logic is the way to go. It works. So if you don't have any of the books, get this new one and also go to um, your website, Love and Logic Institute and even your Facebook. I love how your Facebook, I get these little clips almost every day of just a short little mantra that you can use in your classroom or as a parent. Uh, really nice to see that just pop up every day. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, and check out uh, DanielAmon.com. Daniel's an amazing man and so many resources on his website as well. Thank you. I'll attach all of that to the show notes, but you are a great person. Thank you for sharing your talents and your wisdom and your time with us today. I'm honored to do it. Thank you. 
Thanks for being part of today's class. To submit a question or topic for further episodes, please email elementary.schooled at outlook.com. School is out for today, but please remember, when we strengthen a child, we strengthen society.